is what inspired you to create Black on the Prairies? And um, and then also, can you explain more about it so teachers across Saskatchewan can know what we're referring to? Yeah, so, um, you know, I have been Black on the Prairies in Saskatchewan, particularly for 22 years. And as a journalist and a storyteller, you know, I had made it such a big part of my work um, to really be as um, clear in my work as possible. So what I mean by that is to really represent the communities in the journalism that I do. Um, and so when summer 2020 was happening, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And I was covering the protests in Saskatchewan. And I went particularly in Saskatoon and I saw 4,000 people in the streets of Saskatoon. And by that time I had been covering protests, all different kinds of protests all across Saskatchewan for years. But I had never seen anything like that before. It was the biggest protest in the history of the city, 4,000 people. There was people of so many different kind of uh, communities, ages, um, backgrounds. So it felt really different. It felt like there was something in the air that was different. And I was seeing young Black people leading people. And that was new for me um, in, in, in that part of the country. Uh, I had been to protests you know, seeing protests in Toronto, Vancouver, you know, where, yes, you would see young people leading. But in Saskatchewan, that was particularly unique. And I was keeping an eye on what was happening in neighboring provinces, in Alberta, thousands and thousands of people in Manitoba, small towns as well, all over the place. And and it became clear to me that the journalism needed to shift because we needed to explain what was happening beyond just the headlines uh, of there's been this many people on the streets and they're saying Black Lives Matter. But what are they really saying? What are the deep core issues that are resonating and that are coming up? And how does that translate within the specificity of the prairies, right? Like we're not, we're not in BC, we're not in Ontario, we're not in other parts of the country. We're in our in a particular space with a particular history, and um, with particular realities. And so, I thought at that time that it was really an important opportunity for us to educate beyond the headlines. And so that was what the impulse was behind the, the Black on Prairies project. So then we thought, along with my uh, co-producer and co-creator, Ifi Chiwetelu, how do we exp how do we bring up the complexities of Blackness across history, across space? So 200, more than 200 years of Black presence on the prairies was really important to cement in the conversation to say, yes, people are on the streets right now, but these conversations are not new. And, you know, there was Indigenous people at the protests. What does it mean, right? What are the relationships that Black people have had with Indigenous populations and all different kinds of communities across the prairies for a very long time? And uh, we were hearing people talking about defunding the police. What does politics and political organizing look like for Black people on the prairies? Um, so we wanted to have a comprehensive look at the Black experience on the prairies. And for that, we, um, we really... I'm going to put in a lot of emphasis and anchored ourselves in the work of people like Cheryl Fogel, who have done deep and important work on this. Um, so the project itself, the Black on Prairies project, is a journalistic project. It's also an artistic project. 
It is a multimedia project. We have more than 30 stories um, on different themes, uh, the theme of politics, migration, economics, uh, the future, you know, looking at who are the change makers in our communities. Um, place, we looked at place. How do people inhabit the place? So we really wanted to bring up a conversation that wasn't happening. Um, so that's that's what the project is. And of course, beyond just the content creation, we wanted to make sure that we were bringing the content where people are at. And mm-hmm. what the most important places is the schools. That's why the partnership with and the incredible deep work that Natasha and Sarah did with the teacher's guide was so fundamental. From the very beginning, we knew that we weren't just going to create a project and a journalistic work that was only going to live within the CBC ecosystem. We wanted to bring it to people. Thank you, Romire. Cheryl, do you want to do you want to connect here and, and kind of talk about how you got involved in the Black and the Prairies project as well? Sure, thank you. Um, just a moment ago, I looked over and smiled because my husband just came in. So just so you know, I wasn't wasn't watching TV or anything. Um, I I want to uh, pick up here just by saying how much it means to hear the younger generations talk about connecting with my work and feeling motivated by it because everything in the world depends upon paying it backward and paying it forward, right? So in in my work, I pay it backward to my ancestors. I acknowledge them. And I'm I'm not talking only about my blood ancestors, but also my place ancestors that include Indigenous people and um, people like John Ware, who I am not related to, but who is a place ancestor because he walked these landscapes you know he he died 50 years before I was even born and yet he was my ancestor because he made such an impression and there were so many others so it just really is um affirming and very moving you know to know that all of you who are younger than me have heard my voice and through my voice have heard the voices of our ancestors here. And the young people whose lives you touch, the young people who who Natasha and Sarah created that teacher's guide for will also hear the voices of our ancestors through the work that all of you are doing. Um, I had been following Omara on Twitter as a journalist whose work I really enjoyed. And I have learned over the years that different Black individuals and communities experience life on the prairies very differently. So there are sometimes people who are here from other parts of the world who need to really focus on their own communities. And then there are others who, like Obaira, become very interested in what was the Black life that was here before me and before us in this particular moment. Both approaches to life are valid, but I felt a particular connection to Obaira's work because I saw that she was a person who was interested in learning what, what and who came before. So I was following her. And Ify, I had known from Calgary, she was a university student, excuse me, who um, attended some some presentations that I was doing in Calgary 20 years ago as a young person. So I I knew them both in that way. When Omar approached me about being on the, I guess you called it the board, was it, Omar? (laughs) Excuse me, everyone. Um, I saw it as an opportunity because another thing that I had noticed through my work is that people from my community, that Black migration of 1910, 
had a little bit of mistrust when it came to Canadian institutions and media institutions in particular, because they would see their families and neighbors from those five small black communities on websites, on news websites or in the media. And the people weren't named in them. And it would often say permission for this photo lies. And I'll just pick on the CBC, for example. Mm -hmm. This this photo is the property of the CBC. It wasn't worded in that way, but you all know what I mean. We see those captions, right? And so people would be like, "Why? Why is that? Like, why is why is my family story being taken and not acknowledged? And it doesn't say this is from the collection of this or that family. You know, it's it's almost like we have to ask permission to use our own photos in our own storytelling." Uh, when I talked with Omar about that, about the fact that trust building in the communities is so important and that that work had not been done in the past, Omar completely understood what I was talking about. And although this was not her practice, you know, and, and I'm, I don't want to seem like I'm picking on the CBC because all the institutions were doing the same thing. She was able to commit to being a to to liaising between the communities and those institutions where that trust had broken down. So I saw it as an opportunity to bring people from my community into a project like this to share their stories from a place of trust where they could say, "This is my photo, my great uncle." somebody took this photo and this is where it was and I happen to know that they were harvesting that day and this is what it smelled like and this is what the sky looked like you know that these stories were able to come from a place of true representation so that aspect of it was very important to me to state my feelings about those things up front and I had never been able to have a conversation with someone from an institution that was as honest as that in the way that I was able to have with Omar and it was and it was just you know a matter of um of bringing that trust that I found in my relationship with Omar and in the project to the community I can't speak to everyone's experience in the project I, I only hope that everyone else's experience who I introduced or brought in was as positive as mine. And I also know that Omira isn't responsible for the policies of, of every institution in this country, but she did a great job of honoring the, my relationships with people and understanding that when I ask someone to come into a project like this, my relationship with them is on the line, right? They have trust in me, but I am really sticking my neck out when I invite people into projects like this. That's a very long roundabout way of saying um, how and why I got involved in the project. Thanks for that, Cheryl. So Sarah and Natasha, um, how did you get involved in the project? Uh, well, Natasha tapped me on the shoulder and and kind of volu- told me to... No, I'm kidding. Um, Natasha did approach me with um, this opportunity. No, I had always been... told you. You <laughs> tell the truth. <laughs> I, had, I hadn't heard of Black on the Prairies prior to hearing from Natasha. And um, she had indicated that, you know, you're looking for two people in the classroom with lived experience who would be willing to spend a little bit of time writing a teacher's guide. And and prior to, I had never written a teacher's guide before. Um, so I, as a classroom teacher, only knew, you know, lesson planning from my lens and how it works with my kiddos and with my students. So being able to connect with Natasha on this and go through some of the preliminary reading and, and doing kind of a deep dive really piqued my own interest about a lot of the stories, some of which I had never heard before. And, you know, living in Edmonton, Alberta, born and raised, um, the city is so vibrant. It always is. But there's a lot that 
I have been realizing more and more that I don't know about my own history. I don't know about my own culture. And so getting the opportunity to work on this project was amazing because it gave me a lot of new learning. And so getting to, you know, see students work with it and see students interact with it is is so meaningful because they're getting an opportunity to learn about their history sooner than I did. Not to say that, you know, my parents haven't done a great job because they have, but there was just more to know and a bit of a deeper rooted history to learn. So when Natasha approached me about it and said, we should do this together, um, I don't think I told you no. I am certain that it was a quick yes and we we got the ball rolling and it was so nice to be able to work collaboratively. Um, I mean, despite being friends for the past couple of years, we've never met in person. So it's been a lot of, you know, back and forth online and phone calls and text messages, but there's a connection that's been built because of this, because of this project that I think is so, so wonderful. Um, so for me, I, I really like the way that um, Cheryl uh, prefaced talking about paying it backward and paying it forward. Um, I first met Cheryl um, through Ellipsis Tree Collective. Um, that is um, a theater company uh, that I'm a founding member of. And uh, through that work, really um, had an opportunity to uh, really get to know her and, and learn from and with her. And um, what I have learned a lot about Cheryl, uh, and I, I know many people call her Auntie Cheryl, um, because she really invests herself uh, in the community. And she mentioned not just her generation, but the younger generation paying it forward, um, is that she invests in people. And I don't know about sticking your neck out. I really just see that you 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 surround yourself uh, with incredible groups of people. Uh, you invest in them when you see their potential, despite their flaws, and you really help build up our community. And so I've learned to say yes when Cheryl asks me to do something uh, because I know that it's even if I don't feel like I'm worthy or that it's uh, the right time, I need more experience or whatever, um, that it's an opportunity that won't come by twice. And so I got the call <laughs> from Omira and it said CBC and I'm like, how, what, who? <laughs> and then she said Cheryl's name and I'm like, okay, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do? The answer is yes. And I know that was our conversation. Myra's like, let me finish explaining. I'm like, I'm just going to say yes, because if Cheryl said it's already a yes. And I know that was our conversation. And and right away, I, I thought of Sarah because I had always wanted to collaborate with her because uh, I know she's very humble, but she's one of the founding members of the Black Teachers Association here in Alberta. And I thought, oh my gosh, uh, she's done some incredible projects and collaborations with other people. I really, really want to work with her and have this opportunity. And she's such a brilliant speaker and spokesperson. Um, and she brings so much to the table. It's, uh, I'm humbled by her youth, but yet her endless wisdom. Um, and so it was a no brainer for me to be able to work with her. And yes, she did say yes right away, but I don't think I really gave her a choice in mind is that she wouldn't have. And I, I think at one point I, I kind of got afraid and I was like, Sarah, I don't know if we can do this. The deadline seemed to be so quick. And she's like, take a breath. Um, we got this, we're going to do this. Like, and she's like the queen of organization. Well, <laughs> this is how we're, we're going to make it happen. And so. Uh, that's definitely how I got involved in the project. And um, similar to Sarah, learned so much uh, and resonated with with so many of the stories. But many of the stories was uh, another learning opportunity um, to hear about different experiences and ways of being across the country. 